Hi, good morning everyone. This is Gene from Listening In, KB9001 MWDX, SWL, SSB, and of course uh, WN9ZWC. Um, just want to jump in here and uh, talk to some people about uh, a conversation I had uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was a conversation with another ham radio operator, <clears throat> and it was on, it was on, the, it was on the radio, and I, I had, I had heard him um, uh, calling out on on one of the bands and he was on uh the am mode and i i've never never ever uh it up to that point had uh used the uh, am mode on a ham radio before and i'd always done sideband so uh and i of course i i owned a cb for many years which is am but i i i never did it on ham radio so i decided to uh uh, give it a try. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll bite. So I, I kicked my uh, ICOM 718 up into uh, into AM mode and uh, gave him a call. And after working out some of the bugs I had on my end, because I'm not used to doing it, I had to make some adjustments uh, to get the conversation going, some technical adjustments. Uh, we had a pretty good uh, QSO, which is a conversation, um, uh, or a rag chew. In ham radio, they call it a rag chew. But uh, one of the things that he had mentioned to me was he had said that like people getting into the hobby today are, um, I, I guess the way he put it is um, getting into it for for the wrong reasons, and I he didn't quite qualify that. He didn't really say what he meant behind that. I, I was kind of tracking with what he meant, but I I uh, I, I wasn't uh, uh, completely on board, though I had some of my own ideas that I had overlaid into what he had said. <clears throat> Excuse me, and putting two and two together, um, you know, I kind of came up with some of my my own ideas. And um, that's it's hard to qualify why people get into certain certain hobbies, and um, uh, my thoughts are that uh, I kind of went back to when I first got into the hobby and what what radio meant for us. Of course, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm an older guy. In fact, the the ham radio operator I was talking to was in the hobby many many more years than I was. I've only been in the hobby for 23 years. I didn't start in ham radio until I was uh, 40 years old. So it was quite a ways quite a ways into uh, <laughs> my life that I decided to finally get a ham ham license. And I'd always wanted to do it, but I just decided to do it at that point. So he had a lot more years on than I did. But I did understand uh, radio from a couple different aspects. I, I was a CBer back in the 70s, and um, I understood uh, the, the, what, what radios were back then. They were a completely different animal than what they are today. Uh, the, the radios we had were encased in a metal case, and um, you know you could you could pop the top of that radio off, put a screwdriver in your screw, screwdriver in there yourself, do your own adjustments. Now, if you had the right equipment, you could tune your own radios and and do stuff and replace tubes. Because I <laughs> I go back to the tube days. You know we had we had radio tubes. You know if we burned a tube out, we could pop the top off the radio and then you know stick a, a new tube in there and make it make it work again. You know if a final tube b broke, you ordered a final tube for it and well, you stuck a new final in there. That's <laughs> <laughs> that's how it worked back then it ain't like that today it doesn't work that way uh radios are all uh solid state or it's beyond solid state we used to call it solid state it's way beyond in the, the with the invention of the microchip it shifted the whole the whole uh radio thing into a whole whole different spectrum there's that word again spectrum uh, no pun intended uh but uh, so it shifted into a, a whole different thing. So for us, you know, we, we worked with radios like Heath Kits and Allied Radio and built our own stuff from the plate up. So it was like really, really different for us. And it's different for uh, the people uh, today who are coming in and they're end users and new people are end users, but we're all end users now. We're not... Uh, we're not the techs uh, we, we used to be. We're techs as far as putting components together and, and putting antennas up because antennas, like I said in some of my other videos, antennas are very important. Uh, the biggest thing, the biggest three things about your radio is your antenna, your antenna, and your antenna. And that's just the truth. You have to have a good antenna and you have to learn how to make that antenna resonate with the two-way radio uh, to get a signal out. So it, it really did change for us. So, you know, we all had different reasons why why we got it in the hobby. So what this, like I said, what this leaves us is we're all, we're all operators at this point. So, but there are two sides to the radio hobby. There is a uh, passive and active, meaning passive, um, like medium wave DXing, monitoring and listening, you know, kind of what I set this, this channel up for is to, to talk about listening in. So you don't have to have a ham radio license to get into radio uh, you can listen in. You can be a, you can be a listener. You can be a passive listener. And uh, I'll kind of show you a little bit. 
and I've been setting this up and thinking about it for the last couple of days again, but I set up a, a listening post. I don't know if you can see that. So in a listening post, I have a couple of things here. I have a, a two meter ham uh, radio. There's an Alinko back here. I have an older uh, tube radio and I have my G super radio and an Eton back here. So this is my listening post. So if I'm just, just sitting at my desk, I can kind of kick back and if I want to flip something on and flip some channels or listen to some shortwave or listen to the two meter repeater in my neighborhood, I can do that. So it's just right at my fingertips. And this is besides my shack. This is a little, little extra area. So this is the passive of, of what I do. So that's the passive side of the hobby. And you don't have to have a ham radio license. You could put up a wire antenna and you can listen to the world around you and be what I like to call situationally aware. That's very important. So... If you're thinking of getting into ham radio and you want to get a license, and I want to I want to clarify this for a lot of people who may be coming into the hobby, and they they may have a misunderstanding about what's out on the ham bands and what's out on the shortwave bands because it's all it's all kind of changed um, uh, over the years, and you know it's gotten better. I think ham radio is, is what it's always been, but ham radio right now is really hot. And uh, I'm just shocked at how many people are out there and how many people I hear transmitting um, and, and out there contesting uh, on the bands and talking to each other. Uh, with this last sun cycle, we've got a really good cycle going right now. So this is a great time to get into ham radio or at least listen into ham radio so you can find out what it's about. It. In fact, I really recommend you do that. Listen in a lot. You know, if you want to get a ham radio, you just want to get a shortwave radio and go up and find, find the ham radio bands and listen in and learn what goes on there before you go there. But the thing about ham radio is what I want to really uh, nail down for those and people who are interested in ham radio. You have to get a ham radio license. That ham radio license is issued by the FCC. That ham radio space is very controlled. And if you go up on like the ARRL website, which is the Amateur Radio and Relay League, and they're the, the, the oldest organization out there, um, an advocate for ham radio, you can look at their enforcement bulletins and see the type of enforcement that takes place. And I'm just kind of putting up a little warning because I've seen some people get jammed up in ham radio because somebody complains. Because ham radio operators are also very, very protective of the ham radio space because they want to keep that space so they can keep doing their thing and keep doing their hobby. In fact, they want to expand it. There's some talk about bringing uh, some of the, the techs on board with HF privileges lately, and the techs re usually only allow 10 meters and 2 meters uh, to talk on, and now they're talking about, they're kind of looking at expanding that, and they should. They should give them. Uh, they eliminated the, uh, the code requirement, and I kind of agreed with eliminating the code requirement. Um, I knew code because I was a Navy Sigmund, so I was trained in code, so I already knew it when I came into ham radio, but it still wasn't that easy for me to listen to it because as a uh, Navy Sigmund, we, we use flashing light. I saw it with my eyes. I didn't hear it with my ears. I wasn't a radioman, though I wanted to be a radioman. It's a whole different story. I'll, I'll have to tell you that story some other time. Uh, I wanted to be a radioman, but I became a Sigmund, and I came, became very used to uh, reading flashing light Morse code and I had a hell of a time getting that light out of my head over the years when I tried to listen to it through my ears. It's just a different uh, a different mode of, uh, of Morse code. So they eliminated that but that was good and there's still a lot of people doing code. I think leaving code up to the ham radio operator or the operator was a great idea and I think it was a good idea because it uh, placed a lot of people to where all where they said I don't need that but I want to do that and the guys who want to do that get really good at it and they get proficient and they buy cool equipment to do it with and there's a whole whole thing going on there so that's kind of kind of neat so but they got rid of the code code requirement and they now they're talking about bringing some of the tech people onto HF and that's a great thing they, they belong at HF because HF is where it's at two meter repeaters they're fun and they, they have groups around them but they're usually privately owned uh, by people, but there's many, many of them, and it, if you're up in the mountains, uh, you can't beat having a two-meter repeater near you and a, and a radio in your backpack if you're in an emergency. In fact, one one time I was uh, over in Estes Park, Colorado, camping, and I had my, my two-meter ham radio with me, and I, I was listening in, and I heard... Um, the local, I had the local repeater for Estes Park, and, and then I heard a, um, a guy, a mountaineer, a climber, he w was up on a mountain and he made a summit, and he was calling out to people from the summit, and I was in a, in a position to talk to him, and that was really cool. And I could kind of look up to the mountain where he said he was at, which is many, many miles away, but I could see the summit where he was at, and I, it was cool knowing that I was talking to him, and he was 
up on the top of that monster. So it, it's neat stuff. So so there's it's it is practical in two meters practical, but it's good to have these people come up to the HF bands, and it's good for relationships because ham radio operators talk internationally and we talk to people all over the world and we do our best to maintain good good relationships between people i think it ties us together in the international community so just you know some food for thought you know something to think about so there are different types of nets and that kind of plays into what i what i was talking about with ham radio operators protecting their space there's um, formal nets like OMIS and NADA nets, and you can we'll talk about some of this later, um, and US nets and stuff like that, where they have formal nets where guys go up to collect their uh, different awards for things, and those are formalized. But there's informal nets too, where there's some free falls that are out there where people just get together and they talk on the radio, and you know they talk politics and they you know talk about their wives and talk about their boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> whatever whatever else is going on so so that's you know that's out there too but like I said I just wanted to wanted to clarify that um, I thought you know it was a really um, thought-provoking when he, he talked about why people are getting into the hobby and why he feels it's different but coming from some of us uh, older guys who have been in a hobby for a while it's understandable to kind of kind of you know mix it up and want to want to think about it but I think that's I'm mentioning it here too because I think it would be uh, good for all of you two to think about well why are you getting into the hobby and what do I want out of the hobby and and to also understand that it's it's multi-tiered the uh, radio is is a little bit of everything and a little bit of everybody and one thing I, I got to say about uh, if you decided to get into ham radio ham radio is very welcoming and the people there are very welcoming and they want you there and they want you on the radio with them and they want they want um, to get everybody in the hobby and they want the younger generation to get in a hobby too because um, younger people you're going to be you're going to be the next step in a hobby oh on another note this is really interesting too about how how the things uh, evolve quickly I just read an article online this morning about uh, Cobra radio and that they finally introduced a Cobra CBAMFM. I don't know a lot about that right now. I'm I want to I'm going to do some more research and uh, try to see how they laid that out. Whether they added um, a UHF or VH frequencies. I don't know that. I don't think so. It sounds like there's just an FM mode um, on 27 megahertz. But I'll I'll figure that out. And we'll we'll do a show on that. But I appreciate. It. Okay, took up enough of your time. Uh, be safe out there. Have a great day. Thanks.